you're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. Welcome to the Telltale Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about the religious cult in Panama that attacked the woman and the other people. We talked about it last week on the podcast. Then we're going to be talking about Bill Barr, the attorney general, saying that there's a militant secular effort to suppress religion. Finally, we're going to be talking about the takeaways from the final day of questions in Trump's impeachment trial. Before we get into all of that, why don't we take some voicemails and see what questions people have for us? Hey, this is Chris, and the state is Massachusetts. How was it? How was your time as a Jehovah's Witness? That's a good question. Uh, it was really strange. We'll say that. But it was normal to me. So growing up, I, I was born into the religion, right? And my earliest memories are Jehovah's Witness related. For example, I've told this story before in public talks and things like that. But I remember when I was little, I was afraid that there were monsters in my bedroom i was afraid of the dark most kids are afraid of the dark and i said to my mom i was like mom i'm you know i'm afraid there are monsters in my bedroom and she was like oh yeah there are actually they're demons but if you say jehovah's name then they can't get you you're safe from them so i would wander into my room saying jehovah 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 over and over again things like that i remember telling her i wasn't going to make it into the new system because i i lied when i was like six I would tell lies about whatever stupid things, you know, six-year-olds lie about. And I, I was convinced I wasn't going to make it into uh, the new system, like make it through Armageddon. That's the kind of fear tactics that they program into you. Those are the kinds of memories that I have from growing up as a Jehovah's Witness. Everything that I did in my life always revolved around and focused on whether or not it was pleasing Jehovah, whether or not it was glorifying Jehovah, every decision that I made, I can't tell you how many times I said the phrase, it's against my religion when I was a kid. I remember saying it, you know, when we would stand up to say the Pledge of Allegiance in school, all the kids would say it, and they'd come up to me afterward because I didn't say it, and they'd be like, why didn't you say the Pledge of Allegiance? Why don't you put your hand over your heart and all that? And I'd be like, it's against my religion. Or when all of the kids were celebrating Valentine's Day, putting Valentine's in each other's pouches, and I wasn't. I was the only one in the class not participating. They would say, why won't you accept my Valentine? Why can't I give you Valentine's? Why aren't you giving out Valentine's? It's against my religion. It all revolved around the religion from the very beginning. And it was extremely freeing to me to finally come out of that religion and be able to do whatever I wanted to do. For like many years after leaving the religion, there were still a lot of things that I wouldn't do. For example, I lived with my, with my daughter's great-grandparents, so my my ex's grandparents, I lived with them and with my ex and my daughter at the time, right when I was coming out of the religion. And they celebrated all the holidays, right? Well, I would take part in some of the holidays. I would do some things, but Halloween was absolutely out. Would not do it, no matter what. Wasn't going to take part in anything Halloween related until eventually they slowly kind of whittled me down and were finally, I was finally like, okay, fine. I'll do it. I remember my ex telling me, if you're not going to take our daughter out with you collecting the candy, then you can't have any of the candy. That was enough for me to go next, the following year, I guess. So I, I still stole some of the candy. They can stick it. But that's what it took for me to kind of work my way out of that until finally I broke down and I realized it was all BS I think I was probably 21 or 22 years old. I realized it was all complete BS, Jehovah's Witnesses. There's no reason for me to put myself through this torture and separate myself from society, continue separating myself from society that way, the way that all Jehovah's Witnesses do. And I just 
started living my life. I just started like being a normal human and taking part in all of the normal societal activities that people take part in. And I had a good time. It's fun. Christmas is fun. Halloween is fun. There's nothing wrong with doing that stuff. It, there, there is something wrong with not doing that stuff, with separating yourself from society like that. It's not good. So that's what it was like to grow up as a Jehovah's Witness, if you were wondering. Uh, so I have a friend who came out to me as gay several months ago. But when he came back from the Catholic University he's attending because his parents wouldn't support him if he went to a secular college, uh, he's basically told me that he's trying to repress his sexuality. And he told me that my relationship, he believes, is, quote, offensive to God. Um, what can I do to help my friend realize that suppressing yourself in a dangerous way is harmful? And how can I help him escape what I believe to be a sort of cultish mindset that he's been put into? That's really hard to answer in a short amount of time, as I'm sure you guessed. I do have a couple of videos on my channel about how to deprogram people. Basically, just search for how to deprogram Telltale on YouTube, and I think I have two videos on it. Basically, it's kind of a Socratic reasoning method. Uh, it's it's basically street epistemology for the most part with some modifications to it. If you don't know street epistemology, it could be really helpful to learn how that operates and then watch my videos. It's uh, good resources for that would be Anthony Magnabosco. Really, really legit dude. Love that guy to death. And Cordial Curiosity. Both of those two YouTube channels are top tier and get my recommendation. Uh, watch those two channels, figure out how they do their stuff, figure out their methodology, and see if maybe you can apply it to this situation. Uh, maybe it'll help. Uh, hi, I'm calling in for Fork, and they just wanted to say that they don't think they don't think I've told you this before, but as of this year, I'm a college student at 13, and that it's sad that many religions discourage higher education because I'm really enjoying it. Yes, Fork is uh, somebody on my Discord. So thank you for calling in for Fork. That's awesome. Uh, thank you for the information, Fork. Jehovah's Witnesses do discourage higher education, and that's extremely disappointing to me. In fact, they, they have blatantly outright said that they fear that people are going to start believing in evolution if they allow people to go to college, basically. Now, it's not outright banned. Going to college is not outright banned. You'll not be disfellowshipped for it or excommunicated or whatever for going to college but it's heavily discouraged and you could deal with some level of social shunning people will consider you kind of bad association for going a lot of the time what they'll do since it's a largely uneducated group of people as a result of their rules against college typically you'll find that like there are one or two businesses in the congregation of jehovah's witnesses and they will hire all of the other jehovah's witnesses to work for them usually it's a cleaning company so the, a window cleaning company for example or an office cleaning company and they'll get contracts with all of the offices in the entire area and they'll go around and clean their windows and everything. Low-skilled workforce doesn't require a lot of education to clean windows, for example. But my congregation actually ran all of the POS systems, which is um, cash registers, all the cash registers and everything in my area. Unfortunately, I was, uh, I, I was a software engineer for like years and years, and that meant when I left the religion... I had no access to computer anything in this area because it was all run by the same Jehovah's Witness family and they would not hire me. I had actually for a while considered trying to get hired there so that they would deny me and then I could sue the shit out of them for basically not hiring me for religious reasons. But honestly, it doesn't pay that much anyways. I was getting paid better at the job that I was doing already as a software engineer 
and it wasn't worth my time to go after somebody over principle. But it's extremely disappointing that there's a group of people out there right now who are denying people jobs based on religious grounds, and they're not facing repercussions for it. So, Hey, Owen, this is Byron, B-Y-R-N. Hang on, I just want to say there was a little chuckle at the beginning. Let's, let's listen to the chuckle again. <laughs> Do you know why he, he chuckled? It's because my voicemail is amazing. And you guys you guys haven't called in to hear the voicemail, but I'm so proud of it. It's it's hilarious, honestly. I got this joke from the office like years and years ago. If you were to call in to my voicemail, which by the way, the number is at the bottom of the screen here. If you called in and left a message, you would find my voicemail message, which says something like, if you're comfortable, then leave your name and state at the sound of the tiny truck backing up. So, I don't know. I think it's clever, but that's probably what the chuckle is about. Hey, Owen. This is Byron, B-Y-R-O-N, and I'm in Georgia. Uh, I was curious about um, uh, basically the best way to coexist with a an extremely Pentecostal holiness family. You know, um, we may not necessarily be... Amish, but we may as freaking well be. I am an atheist myself. Well, you know, atheist agnostic. I can't prove that there's no God, but yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, what would be, in your opinion, the the best way to coexist with them without me having to give up my beliefs? Thank you. Really complicated to know how to live with extremist family members. I don't know if they're aware of your beliefs. I didn't really pick that up from the vid, or for, I'm sorry, I didn't really pick that up from the call or not, if if they're aware that you're an atheist or, or not. But it's it can be very complicated to live around religious extremists because religion just permeates every part of their lives in, in really disturbing ways a lot of the time too. I would suggest reaching out and finding community, which it's, it seems like you're kind of doing by being on YouTube, being around YouTubers like me watching my channel and talking to uh, fellow atheists, agnostic atheists like yourself. That's one of the most important parts to keep yourself sane is to make sure that you are engaging with other like-minded people so that you don't go absolutely nuts. So hopefully you find ways to cope with that. Uh, good luck with it, because I know that, that that is not fun. I know from personal experience that it's not fun. There was a voicemail that I got fairly recently. I can't find it now, so I'm not going to be able to listen to it. But the voicemail basically pertained to the percentage of people in the U.S. who believe in creationism or accept evolution as a fact, as the fact that it is. So out of curiosity, I decided to look this up. I decided to go to the, Pre the Pew Research Center website and read about this. The name of this article is For Darwin Day, Six Facts About the Evolution Debate. This was actually released one year ago, February 11th, 2019. Uh, so let's let's give this article a read and see what it has to say. Tuesday's the 210th anniversary of Charles Darwin's birth, a day now celebrated by some as Darwin Day. Darwin is best known for his theory of evolution through natural selection. When Darwin's work was first made public in 1859, it shocked Britain's religious establishment. And while today it's accepted by virtually all scientists, evolutionary theory is still rejected by many Americans, often because it conflicts with their religious beliefs about divine creation. While not an official holiday, Darwin Day has been adopted by scientific and humanist groups to promote everything from scientific literacy to secularism. This year, dozens of events have been planned worldwide, many of them anchored by scientific talks or symposiums. To mark the occasion, here are six facts about the public's views on evolution, as well as other aspects of the debate in the U.S. and elsewhere. So here's fact number one about uh, the evolution debate. Roughly 8 in 10 U.S. adults, 81%, say humans have evolved over time 
according to data from a new Pew Research Center study. This includes one third of all Americans, or 33%, who say that humans evolved due to processes like natural selection with no involvement by God or a higher power, along with 48% who believe human evolution occurred through processes guided or allowed by God or a higher power. The same survey found that 18% of Americans reject evolution entirely, saying humans have always existed in their present form. Here's number two. Around 4 in 10 white evangelical Protestants, 38%, say humans have always existed in their present form, and about a quarter, 27%, of black Protestants share this view, according to the new study. Among white mainline Protestants, just 16% say humans have always existed in their present form. Okay, so it's talking about Protestants here. Uh, Some people may not know what a Protestant is, and they may be confusing it with like Pentecostal, for example. So let me just kind of tell you guys what that is, what the difference is. Back in the 15, 1600s, I don't remember exactly, 15, 20, or 15, 16, maybe. Anyway, you know what? I can just find out. Uh, as American Dad says, what, what was it American Dad said? Um, no need to wonder. We just loaded up our question gun. Let's go answer hunting. We've got the Google machine, the electric Google machine. Martin Luther is basically the guy who created the protestant split and it was 1517 that's when it happened so martin luther comes along in 1517 shakes all kinds of things up made a huge deal out of everything up until that point the the catholic church basically ran everything and before the catholic church east the eastern orthodox church ran everything and then the orthodox church before that so anyway in 1517 there was a split from Catholicism. And like I said, Catholicism would like run towns. It was serious. It ran everything. And they wouldn't let people own Bibles for a while because uh, they didn't want people interpreting the Bible themselves. They wanted the priests interpreting the Bible and telling people what it meant. Plus, you know, literacy was kind of low at the time anyways. So in the early 1500s, Martin Luther comes along and he created this split in Christianity and Protestantism branched off from that. Now, shortly after that, I think 1525, Anabaptists split off even further from Catholicism and from Protestantism. And from Anabaptists, you have the Amish and the Mennonites and the Hutterites and some other weird little niche groups in there too, who are still around. But if you're not Catholic or Eastern or Eastern Orthodox or, you know, Anabaptist or something, you're probably Protestant. Um, That umbrella covers Pentecostal and Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists and the Millerites and Baptist, Methodist, uh, Lutheran, all kinds of other groups. Episcopal. This is kind of a Protestant nation, the U.S. is. If you're not Catholic in the U.S., then you're most likely a Protestant. Not not 100% for sure, but most likely. So it's largely made up, the country is, of Protestants. So 38% of Protestants in the U.S. say humans have always existed in their present form. And about a quarter of black Protestants share that view, is what it says. Among white mainline Protestants, just 16% say humans have always existed in their present form. Similar shares of Catholics, 13%, and the religiously unaffiliated, 11%, say the same. Only among the religiously unaffiliated, those who describe their religion as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular, do a majority, 64%, accept evolution via natural selection with no involvement from God or a higher power. Both Protestants and Catholics are considerably more likely to say evolution was guided or allowed by God than they are to say that humans evolved due to processes such as natural selection or to say that humans have always existed in their present form. This is actually a really interesting development to me because for like a really long time, something like 44 or 43% of the country of the United States of America believed that Noah's Ark was a real literal story, and that is in direct conflict with evolution. If Noah's Ark is a real literal story, then evolution couldn't be taking place 
it just throws everything out. Like, are you telling me this? Some old guy got literally every single animal on the entire planet, including the polar bears and the penguins from the North Pole, or wherever the hell those animals come from. I know one of those comes from the South Pole. Anyway, point is, he got them from all seven continents. Australia. He got kangaroos from Australia and put them on his boat in the Middle East and sailed for 40 days and 40 nights, was locked up in the thing for a year, fed them, disposed of their waste. How did he feed the ant eaters? How did he bring the ants on board? This is just really, really bizarre that people actually believe this, and it is in direct conflict with evolution, so... I guess this is a, a pretty big development. Uh, like I said, this, this was released one year ago. Really fascinating result. Let's continue on with uh, point number three. Scientists overwhelmingly agree that humans evolved over time, and most Americans are aware that this is the case. Among scientists connected to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, 98% say they believe humans evolved over time. Roughly three-quarters, 76% of Americans, perceive that most biological scientists hold this view, according to the new study. Those in the general public who reject evolution are divided on whether there is a scientific consensus on the topic. 46% say biological scientists think humans have evolved due to processes such as natural selection, and 52% say most biological scientists think humans have always existed in their present form. Absolutely, completely bizarre to me that, the, you know, people think that scientists actually believe this. That, that's just mind-blowing. Here's part number four. A series of court decisions have prohibited the teaching of creationism or intelligent design in public schools. Good. In spite of efforts in many American states and localities to ban the teaching of evolution in public schools or to teach alternatives to evolution, courts in recent decades have consistently rejected public school curricula that veer away from evolutionary theory. In Edwards v. Allegard, There's a cat making noise behind me. In Edwards v. Allegard, 1987, for instance, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a Louisiana law requiring public school students to learn both evolution and creation science violated the Constitution's prohibition on the establishment of religion. Here's point number five. While most Americans, 59%, say science and religion are often in conflict, those who are more religiously observant are less likely than others to see this clash between faith and science, according to a 2015 Pew Research Center survey. Among those who attend church at least once a week, 50% view religion and science as in conflict, compared with nearly three-quarters, 73%, of those who seldom or never attend worship services. At the same time, most people, 68%, say that their own personal religious beliefs do not clash with accepted scientific doctrine. Fascinating. Here's the last point on this one. Outside the U.S., there are many other countries where sizable shares of the population reject evolution. In Latin America, for example, roughly 4 in 10 or more residents of several countries, including Ecuador, Nicaragua, and the Dominican Republic say humans and other living things have always existed in their present form. This is true even though the official teachings of Catholicism, which is the majority religion in the region, do not reject evolution. In Central and Eastern Europe, evolution is broadly accepted, but roughly half or more of adults in two countries, Armenia and Bosnia, reject it. Meanwhile, Muslims in many nations are divided on the topic, although majorities of Muslims in countries such as Afghanistan, Indonesia, and Iraq reject evolution. That is extremely fascinating. Something I want to point out here is the fact that it says, um, this is true even though the official teachings of Catholicism, which is the majority religion in the region, don't reject evolution. This is important because it, it really comes down to the fact that it's more of a cultural thing, right? Like, I don't really care what the leadership of a group is saying necessarily. Like, Jehovah's Witnesses could come out tomorrow and say, okay, I guess you don't have to shun friends. They already say you, you won't be disfellowshipped for not shunning family members. But it doesn't really matter. It's part of the culture. It's part of the group. It's part of the group dynamic. That's what really matters. What, what is happening within the group, within the culture of the group, within the society, that's what matters. Catholicism largely says you can believe pretty much what you want about evolution. 
doesn't really matter in the end because the people culturally do not believe it. That's the significant part about it. Intentions don't really matter in this. That's not always true. Sometimes intentions are extremely important in some things. When you're dealing with cults or religious groups or whatever, intentions are irrelevant. It's what happens. It's what's, it's what's going on within the group. Within the group's belief system, the group dynamics, that's what matters. I actually have a video coming out about that pretty soon. I address it regarding Teal Swan, so keep a lookout for it. Tell you what, let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to take a look at the religious cult that killed, I think, nine people in Panama. So give us about 30 seconds, and we will be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. So the next article I wanted to take a look at is called Inside the Religious Death Cult That Massacred Seven in Panama. Last week on the podcast, I talked about this, and I think the clip is releasing on my channel on Thursday. It may already be out by the time you see this. Uh, Just keep a lookout for it. Either way, this woman was the victim of a death cult in Panama, and it was really, really horrific. It's a horrific story. So I wanted to dive into it a little bit more and see what the story is of this group. This article is by the Daily Beast. Jeremy Critt, it looks like, wrote it January 20th, 2020. Cali, Colombia. At first glance, the story looks almost too twisted to be true, like some Heart of Darkness spinoff for the post-post-colonial age. Joseph Conrad himself couldn't have dreamed up an episode more gruesome and vile than the one Panamanian police stumbled onto last Tuesday, deep within a semi-autonomous indigenous comarca or district of the Nagabe Bugli people. I know I pronounced that wrong. I apologize. Authorities had been alerted by a handful of villagers who turned up at a hospital outside the comarca showing signs of violent beatings, their mouths and tongues roasted with burning sticks, telling tales as best they could of strange rituals going on in the jungle. So the cops were prepared to find something bad out there in the Selva. District Prosecutor Rafael Beloyes told local journalists. They just didn't know how bad it would be. Upon arriving at the hamlet of Alto Tarón, Situated in northwestern Panama and lacking both electricity and phone service, investigators found at least 15 people being tortured in a thatch-roofed structure belonging to a sect called Nuevo Luz de Dios, New Light of God. The victims, including two pregnant women, were bound on the floor before a ritually slaughtered goat. At least one woman was naked and had likely been... Meanwhile, some nine priests, quote-unquote priests, were exhorting the prisoners to accept the word of God while striking them with knives and machetes. All these rites were meant to kill them if they did not repent of their sins. Prosecutor Beloye said, Armed officers broke up the ceremony, cuffed the crazed clergy, and freed the detainees. Because the area was so remote, helicopters had to be called in to evacuate the wounded. I'm so sorry for these people. We demand the immediate eradication of this satanic sect. Ricardo Miranda, elected leader of the Camarca Nagabe Bugli, which is, I think, where this happened. About a mile from the church, quote-unquote, police found a shallow grave that held seven bodies apparently belonging to victims who had not repented fast enough. God. One of these was Belen Flores... 33, who had been six months pregnant when she was murdered. Five of the others were Flores' children, aged 1 to 11. The five slain kids were the grandchildren of Mario Gonzalez, 60, who stands accused of their deaths. Mario Gonzalez, their their grandfather, was the one who killed them. The self-described messiah of the sect, quote-unquote, Gonzalez was also the father of the pregnant Flores and allegedly killed her as well. The sixth victim in the grave, also a minor, apparently belonged to a family of the messiah's unfortunate neighbors. What went wrong in this dude's brain? What, what broke in his brain? 
What happened to allow him to do these things? I don't get it. One of the priests said that God had given them a message, Baloyes said. It supposedly came in a dream, demanding that they cleanse the village through exorcism. But others claimed the death cult wasn't working on God's behalf, at least not their gods, at all. An elected leader of the Camarca, Nagabe Bugli, Ricardo Miranda, issued a statement decrying the Alto Tyrone sect as demonic and saying it went against the Christianity traditionally practiced in the region. Well, I I'm sorry, I just, I... They weren't worshipping Satan, they were worshipping God. I mean, they did some really horrific stuff in the name of God, but that's just what it is. It was in the name of God. You can say they're not true Christians, but if they call themselves Christians, then they're Christians, right? A Christian is kind of a category. At any rate, that's really, really heartbreaking for these people. We demand the immediate eradication of the satanic sect, which violates all practices of spirituality and coexistence found in the Holy Scriptures, uh, Miranda said. Witnesses said the New Light group was relatively new to the area, having been active locally for about three months. Satanic rites, child sacrifices, a messianic leader who slays his own family. These are the wicked and depraved parts of the story that have been making headlines through the hemisphere. The sensational angles that may give Trumpistas and wall builders fresh fuel for fear-mongering, new talking points under their breaths, of course, about savage brown people south of the border. Yeah. But there's another side to this tale that makes it even more Conradian, involving, as it does traditional people's cultural degradation, harsh economic conditions, and a hardline extremist version of Christianity exported to Panama straight from the good old U.S. of A. Yeah, people don't realize that a lot of these sects kind of are born from the United States. And you do find this kind of thing in the U.S. a whole hell of a lot more often than you find it elsewhere. So, you know, pot calling the kettle black a little bit here. Maybe the Nagabe Bugle are the ones who need the wall. That's very true. That I can totally agree with that one. Theirs is the largest and most populous of Panama's five indigenous districts. Some 96% of its 214,000 residents live in extreme poverty. There are few schools, clinics, and roads, little local law enforcement, almost no administrative infrastructure. From my understanding, there is zero local law enforcement. They had to go to another district, basically, to get the cops there. Uh, to come help enforce what was happening or try to enforce the law. The whole thing is extremely heartbreaking. I, I'm very, very sad to see this happen to these people. I just hope that they find some way to heal from it because this is just very disturbing, and very heartbreaking. It's like when we heard about Heaven's Gate, the Heaven's Gate cult. You guys probably aren't old enough to remember this. I'm not actually old enough to remember it. It happened in 1996, I think March 26th, the night of March 26th morning of March 27th, the Heaven's Gate cult committed mass suicide. 39 people killed themselves, basically, by mixing applesauce with um, sleeping pills and putting bags over their heads. And it was a big thing. It was all over the news. They were planning to go to a spaceship in the sky that was flying behind hale -Bopp Comet and going to take them off to the uh, what was it? It's called um, the Kingdom of Heaven, the evolutionary level above human. Anyway, there are some real crazy groups out there. And, it, you know, we can sit here and say, how could anybody ever believe that stuff? But I was that extreme one one time. I was extreme enough at one point that I would be willing to take a pill if I was ordered to by the Watchtower Society. I would have done it. A lot of Jehovah's Witness out there. I'm sorry, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses out there would do it now. My mom would certainly do it. No question. Yes. It's really, really crazy when we hear people actually do that stuff. But there are millions of people out there right now who would be willing to if ordered. Breaking their programming is one of the most important parts of this whole thing for me. Let's take another 30 second break. Uh, we'll be right back. When we come back, we're going to be talking about Bill Barr, the Attorney General, talking about a militant secular effort to suppress religion. Give us about 30 seconds. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com.
The next article I wanted to take a look at is entitled William Barr, or Bill Barr, who's the Attorney General. There's a militant secular effort to suppress religion. This is by the Friendly Atheist blog. It was written by Hemant Mehta. So let's give this a read and see what it has to say. During an interview with New York's Cardinal Timothy Dolan yesterday, Attorney General William Barr did what he does best, lie. He claimed that there was a militant secular effort to suppress religion, despite failing to define whatever militant secularism means. The problem today is not that religious people are trying to impose their views on non-religious people, Barr told Dolan on his Sirius XM radio show Conversation with Cardinal Dolan. It's the opposite. It's that militant secularists are trying to impose their values on religious people, and they're not accommodating the freedom of religion of people of all faith. We believe in the separation of church and state, Barr stated, but what permits a limited government and minimal command and control of the population and allows people to have freedom of choice in their lives and trust in the people is the fact that they are people that are capable of disciplining themselves according to moral values. Okay, what an extremely confusing mess of words that he just spewed out. The hypocrisy is obvious here, says Hemant Mehta. Secular people are fighting for government neutrality on matters of religion. Most of us don't want the government interfering in our private decision, certainly not when they involve our bodies or beliefs. Barr and his fellow Republicans want government preference for one faith. They want to push their conservative Christian beliefs onto everyone else. They want to block women from obtaining abortions. They want to block LGBTQ people from having civil rights. They want to punish non-Christian immigrants and refugees, etc. None of that is separation of church and state. That's a theocracy under a different name. 100% agree with Hemant Mehta here. Barr also claimed in another part of the interview that atheists were trying to drive religion out of public life. No atheist organization or prominent individual has said religious people should be punished for their beliefs. No one's fighting to shut down churches. Trying to persuade people to think like you isn't a crime, and everyone does that. It's scary that the top lawyer in the country doesn't have a basic understanding of the law. But that's also the only reason Donald Trump appointed him. A competent lawyer wouldn't say any of this. It takes a conservative Christian like Barr to be this ignorant. I don't think it's ignorance. I think he knows. I think he is well aware of what's happening and and what's going on around him. And I think he just wants it to be this way. I think he is aware that we're not trying to force people to be non-religious. We're not trying to force atheism down people's throats. You can feel free to sit in school and pray all you want, but you can't force me to pray with you. That is a violation of rights. Compelling somebody to do something or or imposing your ideas or beliefs on other people is not a right. I have the right to be free from religion. And they just don't seem to understand that. Or maybe they do understand that and they just don't care. I think if there was a concerted effort to force Muslim prayer into school five times a day with prayer rugs saying it to Allah and everything replace every instance of the word God with the word Allah even though it's the same God you know in the Pledge of Allegiance and everything else in school and people would lose their shit they would realize how fucked up it is to force this stuff down people's throats how wrong it is to force people to adhere to your lifestyle choices like it's straight up wrong for you to try to cram your religion down my throat and it's wrong for my tax dollars to fund you doing that to children i don't want my tax dollars paying for a pa system in a school that's going to be used to transmit uh muslim prayers to allah day in and day out just like you don't And I also don't want my money going toward a PA system that is used to say Christian prayers. If a kid wants to sit there and say a prayer silently to himself, I have no issue with that. That's never been banned and it never will be. But that's not what they want. They want the school district to sponsor the prayers. And this whole bit about a militant secular effort to suppress religion, this is outrageous. What's militant about it? 
I, I'm not really understanding. Militant, what, you know what? Let's just look this up. Let's get a Google definition here. Combative and aggressive in support of a political or social cause and typically favoring extreme, violent, or confrontational methods. That doesn't describe my position at all. I, I have always been against violence. Actually, I've been against confrontational methods too. I'm against extremism. I'm against aggressiveness or combativeness. I just want you to stop forcing your religion down my throat and my kid's throat. That's all I want. Is that that difficult? Like, I don't understand why people are having such a hard time with this. Like, the state of Alabama, like, every other week has a story of a school praying over the PA system. What is this? This is blowing my mind. Let's take a 30-second break. When we come back, we're going to be taking a look at the impeachment trial and some things that we learned from the final day of questions in the trial. So give us 30 seconds, and we will be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. The next article I wanted to take a look at is entitled Four Takeaways from the Final Day of Questions in Trump's Impeachment Trial. This is on the Washington Post. The article is by Amber Phillips. It was released January 30th. As of the moment that this is going public was just a few days ago. So let's read the uh, the four takeaways here. Here's takeaway number one. Democrats almost certainly aren't getting the four Republicans they need to call witnesses. We now know that they did not. That came out in the news. Just to give a little bit of background on how this operates, basically... All right, so most people know this. I'm just going to explain it anyway so we all have the baseline knowledge, okay? There are three branches of government. There's the executive branch, which includes the president and any offices under the president. The military is included in the executive branch. And then we have the legislative branch, which includes Congress. And Congress is made up of the Senate and the House of, Rep of Representatives. And then we have the judicial branch, okay? The judicial branch is the Supreme Court and anything underneath the Supreme Court. In an impeachment situation, the House of Representatives, which is made up of, at this moment, I believe, 438 House members, and it's split up into different districts. Each state has a different number. I think my state of West Virginia has four districts or something, so we have four different House members. Each state has a different number of House of Representatives members, but each state only has two senators. So there are a total of 100 senators, and at this moment, it does change from time to time. I think it's 438 House of Representatives members. Right now in the U.S., the House of Representatives is controlled by Democrats. There's a majority of Democrats in the House of Representatives, but there's just barely a majority of Republicans in the Senate. I think 51 Republicans, and there are 47 Democrats, and then there are two independents in the Senate. Bernie Sanders and Angus King from Maine are independents, but they caucus with the Democrats. So for all intents and purposes, they're considered Democrats, too. So 51 Republicans and 49 people who caucus with Democrats. In an impeachment situation like this, what we've got is the House of Representatives, they vote on whether or not to impeach the president. And impeachment means we're going to move forward with a trial. And if during this trial the president is found guilty of the charges, then he is removed from office. So in the trial, we have the Senate, who basically acts as the jurors. The Senate pretty much is the jury. But the Senate controls how the trial plays out. They control who the witnesses are, if they even have witnesses, and all of the other stuff. The Supreme Court acts as the judge, except the, the Supreme Court's really only there for, like, procedural stuff. They're just there to kind of make sure order is kept. Uh, the Senate really does control everything in the impeachment trial. So as I said, there are 51 Republican senators and the rest are 
either Democrats or independents. There was a vote recently as to whether or not they were going to allow witnesses to speak at the trial. And the vote was basically no, they're not going to have witnesses, which is extremely bizarre to me. Why is the jury deciding what evidence they want to hear? How can they know if it's legitimate evidence or not until they hear it? It's just a really, really strange, bizarre situation. Well, the end result was they need a majority. They need a majority, uh, 51 senators to vote to get witnesses or to block witnesses. And there was one senator, one Republican who broke ranks and voted to have witnesses there. Every other Republican senator voted against having witnesses. The one who voted to have witnesses was none other than Mitt Romney, the Mormon. The Mormon who ran for president. Dude hates Trump, honestly, interestingly enough. Gotta have respect for the guy for that, but I will still do whatever it takes to keep him out of office, any office, because he is the political wing of the Mormon church. It's just not good. He is a toxic member of the of the political body because he's so heavily entrenched in the Mormon church. In my eyes, I want him gone. Like I said, got to respect him for voting for witnesses, but it is what it is. Uh, so the point number one, Democrats almost certainly aren't getting the four Republicans they need to call witnesses. They did not, we know now. Point two, all eyes are on John Roberts. As I said before, John Roberts, he's the chief justice of the Supreme Court. So he is kind of keeping the peace and making sure everybody follows proper procedures in the impeachment trial, but that's about his only role. Let's read the article here and see what it says. So what if there's a tie in Friday's vote for witnesses? Could the Chief Justice break it by casting the deciding vote? That debate has been bubbling over the course of the Senate trial among academics and pundits. Now it will boil. For example, law scholar Frank Bowman argued in SCOTUS blog earlier this month that Roberts can cast the tie-breaking vote in this case. He's the presiding officer of the Senate, and when the vice president performs that function in regular Senate business, they cast a vote. But there's no consensus on that. Some legal scholars agree with Senate Republicans that a 50-50 vote simply means the motion failed. It's not even clear who will get to decide whether Roberts gets to decide. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky, who's basically controlling the trial. Roberts in his role as the presiding official or the Senate parliamentarian. Could the Senate vote on whether to allow Roberts to cast a tie vote? As I said before, basically it was blocked. Having witnesses at the trial was blocked, which I think is complete bullshit. I don't care if it's Bernie Sanders on trial right now. It does not matter to me. You need to be able to remove somebody from office who is acting tyrannical, even if it's Bernie Sanders, anybody. And hearing the evidence is part of that process. They're not even listening to the evidence. What is wrong with this political system? It's broken. I want to move to Canada, seriously. You know, when I was Jehovah's Witness, there was this whole thing where they were all like, oh, you shouldn't leave no matter what. Don't ever leave. You can work out your problems. Fix the problems. It was just if you left, you'd be punished for it. You'd be shunned. You'd be hated. You'd be spit upon. That was the very last thing that you could do is leave. Well, I'm not buying it anymore. I'm not a part of this bullshit anymore. I'm not a part of religion anymore. And I don't believe in dogma where I have to stick around no matter what. I don't have to ride anything into the ground. If something is wrong or broken, I can leave with a clear conscience. I'm not going to be shamed into staying in this country because patriotism, blah, 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 whatever. I don't even care. If it's corrupt and crooked and disgusting, I should be allowed to leave. And I'm going to one of these days. I'm moving to Canada. That's my plan. So saddle up, Canada. Here I come. The whole thing disgusts me. Anyway. Let's continue on. Point three, Trump's defense still hasn't answered key questions about his intent. When did Trump first pause a military aid to Ukraine? And when did he start talking to Ukraine about investigations into the Biden family? Those are two key questions Republican senators asked of Trump's defense on Wednesday, and Trump's lawyers had no answer. White House Deputy Counsel Patrick Philbin acknowledged that there is no evidence of Trump having talked with Ukraine officials about the Bidens before Joe Biden entered the 2020 race. 
Understanding when Trump paused the aid and when he first became concerned about the actions of Biden and the former vice president's son, Hunter, in Ukraine would go a long way in proving or disproving Democrats' case that the president abused his power. After having a day to think about how to address these questions to key votes on witnesses, they didn't have any new answers. And here's the final, the final point, point number four. Rand Paul's attempt to publicly out the whistleblower. Why do they need to know who the whistleblower is? He's so completely irrelevant at this point. He could have gone away completely and it wouldn't matter. We have tons of evidence outside of what the whistleblower said. All the whistleblower did was draw attention to this issue. That is it. Now we have the testimonies of all kinds of different people. John Bolton, Gordon Sondland, is that his name? Sondland? Marie Ivanovich, I think her name is. Uh, Vinman, Bill Taylor, I think is another. Am I up to person number five? Did I name five people? Why do we need the name of a whistleblower? It's so irrelevant. Literally all they're doing by trying to publicly out the whistleblower here is putting a man's life in danger. That's what they're doing. They're putting somebody's life in danger. Why? Why are they doing that? Why are they trying to put this person's life in danger? I don't understand. They should be put in prison for that. This week, Trump's legal team evolved their defense of the president in the direction of, so what if he did do it? As they did, some Trump allies escalated their efforts to undermine House Democrats' case in ways other than directly disputing the evidence. On Wednesday, Senator Rand Paul, Republican from Kentucky, sent a question to the desk of the Chief Justice, who did not read it aloud. On Thursday, Paul tried again, and again Roberts refused. In the question, Paul mentioned a name that some media outlets have reported is the alleged whistleblower. We know what was in it because Paul left the trial after his question was batted down and read in full, I'm sorry, and read it in full to a room of reporters. It's extremely honorable of the Chief Justice to not read the question. The guy is a, 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 an extreme Republican, Chief Justice Roberts, and was appointed by um, George Bush Jr., I believe. So he's got some extremely questionable views and ideas and beliefs on things and has made some really horrifically terrible decisions in Supreme Court cases. But holy hell, is that respectable for him to not read the name of the whistleblower like that? Rand Paul, my question today is about whether or not individuals who were holdovers from the Obama National Security Council and Democrat partisans conspired with Schiff staffers to plot impeaching the president before there were formal House impeachment proceedings. Eventually, another Republican senator's question of whether Schiff's staff engaged with the whistleblower before he filed his complaint was read aloud. Schiff angrily called it a smear. Schiff's committee did get a heads up about the existence of a whistleblower complaint before it got filed, but there is no evidence Schiff was working in concert with the whistleblower. Schiff has repeatedly said he has not met the whistleblower. Now, I don't know who the whistleblower is exactly because none of the shows that I watch will say the name. I heard it was Vinman. I don't know if that's true or not, but either way, it doesn't matter. The whistleblower is completely irrelevant. Every, you know, all of the other testimonies are what matters at this point. The thing that the whistleblower said was like second and third hand and totally irrelevant to the case could be totally thrown out at this point. It would not make a difference. Members of this body used to care about the protection of whistleblower identities, Schiff said. They didn't used to gratuitously attack members of committee staff, but now they do. I think it's disgraceful. Whistleblowers are a unique and vital resource for the intelligence community. Couldn't agree more on that one. It's extremely disappointing what's happening right now. Uh, Leah Bryant, what do you think about genetically modified skeptics video titled Four More Things Atheists Should Not Say? Point number two is my favorite. I haven't actually seen it. I don't watch atheist content, interestingly enough. I don't want to, like, steal anybody's ideas, basically, because I talk for a living. I talk a lot, and I don't want to inadvertently take an idea that somebody had and kind of dress it up as my own, even by accident. So I just don't watch other people's content. I've seen genetically modified skeptics videos. I've seen Holy Kool-Aids and Godless Engineers and Mr. Atheist. I've seen all of their videos. I mean, I've seen some of the videos of all of those people just to get an idea for their style, their content and, and things like that. But I do not watch atheist content regularly just so that I don't steal people's ideas. 
Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. Nervardia says, what do you think of, of free speech absolutism, i.e., should people be allowed to spread lies under free speech? Is telling someone who is lying to shut up infringing on free speech? Good question. Um, free speech is largely a political concept, so it's a protection from government punishment. Like, you can't be thrown in jail for saying something. But even in the U.S., there are limits on free speech. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. That's like the standard cookie cutter example that people always give. There are limits on free speech. You can't say, for example, I'm going to kill blah, blah, blah. If this person happens to be extremely important and well-connected, I'm just saying. I'm not going to say the phrase because I don't want to be arrested, but you can't say it is the point. So the question is, where is the line with freedom of expression? Because that's more of a philosophical, conceptual type of thing, right? Where is my line with it? I believe people should be allowed to say anything that they want, for the most part, up to the point it becomes violent. So a while back, we were covering the NIFB, the New Independent Fundamentalist Baptist Church, and they were expressing a direct interest in seeing gay people killed. And I felt justified in destroying them for it, trying to take their platform away over that. I won't take the platform away of just a, just anybody. Like Jehovah's Witnesses, I don't want to shut them up. I want them to continue saying stupid shit so that I can continue destroying them over it, continue debunking them. Let them hang themselves with the stupid shit they say. In fact, I said this in a video recently, but you guys may remember Milo Yiannopoulos. This guy was, I believe, alt-right. Either way, really, really right-wing dude, right? And said some really crazy things. There was a real movement to deplatform him. So people hold him up as an example of when deplatforming succeeded. But did it? Is he an example of when deplatforming succeeded? I don't think so. I don't think he is. I think he's a good example of when sunlight destroyed him. So he was going around to college campuses and speaking despite the deplatforming effort until he said something so incredibly stupid that even his own side could not defend him anymore. If you guys are wondering what that was, I think it was something about he was speaking out in favor of basically removing the age of consent completely. You may want to look into it a little bit deeper because I can't, don't quote me on that. But he said that, and even his own side could not defend him at that point. That's what it took, sunlight. We just needed to get his stupid, horrific ideas uh, spread out far enough out in the open for everybody to realize how horrifically stupid they are. And now the dude is canceled. That's what it takes. It takes your side canceling you for it to actually work, not the other side. Sometimes you can succeed in canceling a group, for example, a violent group like the NIFB. Sometimes you do succeed in getting them canceled, and they deserve it. They need to be canceled. But you know what happens in that case? If the NIFB were to be canceled, for example, like removed from the public uh, spotlight, not allowed to have YouTube channels anymore, not allowed to uh, engage in public debate or public uh, discourse. What happens at that point is exactly what happened with Alex Jones. He locks into his position deeper and all of his fans, they don't go to YouTube to see him anymore because he's not there. So guess what? He's, they don't get suggested videos for less extreme groups. They go to his website and the very next video that plays is another Alex Jones video every single time. It just gets more and more radical because he can say whatever he wants to say and the very next video that's going to play is another one of his videos no matter what because it's his website. So when you cancel people like that and remove their access to public platforms, the group gets more fundamentalist and more radical and more extreme and gets locked into an echo chamber even deeper 
to the point where they just can't escape and their ideas just get crazier and crazier. That's why I want them out in the open. I want them out saying the stupid things to the wide world. I want them saying that stuff where I can hear it so that I can debunk it. So that's kind of my position on free speech. I'm not an absolutist necessarily, but I am real pro free speech. Really, really pro freedom of expression because that is how you weed out the stupid fucked up ideas in society and expose people for the fucked up individuals that they are. So tell you what, that's where we're going to end it for now. I appreciate the super chats. appreciate the questions. I appreciate the voicemails. If you guys have any voicemails, any questions for me, then give it a call. Leave me a message and I'll play it on the next episode of the podcast in one week. Again, thank you guys for coming and I will talk to you next week. If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can support me on Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and stickers and stuff on there. Second, you can support me by checking out my Etsy store. I sell 3D printed stands for every system from the original Nintendo to the Xbox One. And finally, if you want to support me in other ways, you can check me out on my other channels. I have the podcast channel, which is where I talk about whatever's on my mind. Politics, social issues, whatever. You can also find it everywhere podcasts can be found. Or you can check out the videos on my main channel where I focus on destructive cults. As it is with most channels these days, I rely on the support of viewers like you to keep my channel alive, so sharing my work is extremely helpful. Anyways, check me out in all those places if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys.